Hello everyone. We're going to be doing a video on some of the stuff that we did and some considerations for moving in and out of Alaska, as well as some of the things that are here on Fort Wainwright. First thing I'm gonna do is go over general things about being in Alaska, the post itself, and then just things around the area. And then we will also cover stuff about outgoing, leaving from Alaska, and then coming to Alaska as well. So I'll try and post the times that those start down below in the description uh, so that you can skip to those if you're not interested in this, but there is a whole lot of information to cover just in general. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is uh, just general information when you're moving to and from Alaska is the mile post. We have a uh, mile post right here. We just got this from uh, Walmart. You can also order them online. It's a very thick book. And this mile post covers, it's the mile by mile highway logs. Uh, it, so it covers major routes. So this one has 30 major routes, 60 side trips. If you want to take a little bit different route, 15,000 plus miles that have been actual mapped and then 100 maps. Some of them are, they're pretty small and they cover different sections, but this is really good. And then there is uh, right here towards the beginning is a large pullout planet trip map. So this thing, um, if you tear it off that preparation, you can actually fold this map out um, and take it with you. And then it has the actual mileage charts too. So this gives you the distance in miles to different cities and places in Alaska as well. Um, it does cover some things to do while you're in Alaska um, and whatnot. Also some places to stop like scenic places and other things like, so this one says explore Fairbanks and talks about some of the stuff there. Um, but the mile post is going to be a huge thing when you're coming to or leaving Alaska, when you're actually planning your trip, because this is going to help you decide where to go. It also does in some of the descriptions. So we'll pop into here. Um, it does have like on this page, it has little pictures for fuel. And there's another picture right there for a tent for camping. It does uh, tell where lodging is. There's a uh, fish right there. So there is um, ice fishing. This particular portion is talking about ice fishing. So this is a really good way for you to plan your fill-ups, the places that you can actually stay and sleep. If you're not doing hotels, then it does have the campgrounds in there and everything. Um, it also does have little ads and stuff for local areas as well. Just give you a little bit more information about where you're going through. Um, good thing about this also is that if you lose service or anything, then you do have this hard copy of a very in-depth map of all sorts of different areas going through. And this covers pretty much all the border crossings as far as I'm aware and gives you the routes to and from them. And it's mile by mile. So it tells you what is going on the entire time. Um, and then some of these, uh, so it actually has pre-planned trips in here and it will tell you how, it'll give you specific directions on those. So, um, and then these are some of the other little maps that it has in here that it shows. So this mile post is absolutely imperative and a very important thing for you to have when you're coming to Alaska or leaving. You can't travel to and from Alaska, driving that is, without running into road construction and those dang pilot cars. A uh, big problem that we ran into on our drive up here we uh, passed over the border in Washington, driving from Texas, and we were pulling a 16-foot trailer. By the time we reached uh, this location, due to the road construction and some of the poor uh, road conditions, the front of that trailer, which did have that diamond plating up there, was completely dented in. Um, one good thing about uh, taking a trailer up here is that they sell a lot better than what you can uh, than what you buy them for down in the lower 48 so we actually ended up making about a thousand fifteen hundred dollars on the trailer we bought it new before we came up here but road construction so they do can road construction on multiple parts of the highway as you're coming up and a lot of those just end up being gravel and you have to wait for the dang pilot car so pilot cars were the biggest annoyance the whole time we were driving. 
I think we caught somewhere between five or more on our way up here. And some of those strips were so long that you'd have to wait 20 or 30 minutes, maybe even longer before you, before the pilot car ends up coming back to pick you up and take you that length. Because it's only a one way at that point. So you have to follow the, the pilot car as you're going. And usually there will be signs or people posted down there at the end which will stop you from going. So you can't just pass it, but you will have to follow that pilot car. We did on occasion use that opportunity while waiting for a pilot car to fill up our car though. Um, so we did have fuel cans that we brought with us and sometimes we uh, took that opportunity to go ahead and just drop an, an extra fuel uh, can in there and put some fuel in our tanks while we are waiting for the car to actually come back and pick us up. The border crossing wasn't as bad for us as it has been for a lot of people. We've heard the horror stories about how people have been made to completely empty out their full trailers and their vehicles with their families and everything in order for the border crossing to inspect their vehicles. We actually got close to that with our 16 foot trailer, but uh, we fortunately had our dogs and our kids in there and I think they took pity on us because they were crying and making a lot of noise. A big reason for them to search vehicles is if you have mentioned at all or um, if you seem uh, suspicious or anxious or something, but if you mention um, weapons and ammo, you're probably going to get searched when you cross the border. Other than that, it's been pretty pleasant for us. There are some programs like Nexus and there's another one that you can do to pre-certify. I'm not sure who all is eligible for that, but it might be worth looking into. I'm actually going to look into that here in a little bit and we can uh, give you an update on that on one of our actual traveling vlogs. Documents for crossing the border. Some things that you're going to want to have, and I know it's changed a few times. Um, it was changing right when we were coming up here in 2015. Um, so you used to be able to come up here without passports, just using the orders and an ID card. However, the last, uh, the latest change I was tracking is that pretty much everybody needs passports except for the service member in which the service member does need to go a copy of their orders, military ID and birth certificate in order to cross. We got passports for everyone as we're getting ready to drive back down and through because I don't want to have to deal with any of it and I don't want to have to deal with the fact that I'm military at all or anything. Uh, that just raised more questioning and they have a lot of people who come up uh, back and forth through there and most military is usually carrying stuff and so I think it's a little bit higher likelihood that you're going to be searched if they actually know that you're military because generally we have uh, weapons that are usually prohibited in their country so you definitely can't take any uh, handguns or anything through there but we'll get more into that just a little bit later. Weapons and ammo crossing the border. It can be a pain, but if you get a hold of the Royal Canadian Police ahead of time, then you can square away yourself and hopefully avoid a bunch of uh, problems. You can pre-do the paperwork before you ever even get there, and that should help expedite it. There are three categories for weapons when you're going into Canada. There's prohibited, restricted, and non-restricted. Prohibited generally includes handguns, restricted, is uh, usually things like shotguns with uh, short barrels and uh, other items. You can go over to the website and see the exact, the exact specifications or you can call them. I would highly advise that you do that. I've called them multiple times this time um, as we were getting ready to move. Just to make sure that I had most update information and make sure that I'm not going to run into any issues as I cross the border. Then there are non-restricted firearms. That means there are no restrictions on these. And so two, two of the weapons that we are going to be taking this time as we cross the border are shotguns. So both of our shotguns are just full length, not modified at all. I believe they have to be over an 18 inch barrel if I remember correctly. Both of mine are, so I didn't really pay attention to that figure. So you'd have to actually verify that yourself. But the barrels have to be over a specific length and I'm pretty sure you can't modify the butt stock much at all. Like you can't have sawed off shotguns or anything like that, heavily modified ones. Uh, as far as the non-restricted firearms, you still do have to register them when you cross the border in Canada. 
For your non-restricted firearms, you do have to register them when you go into Canada. In order to do that, you can go online to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police website, uh, which also usually works in conjunction with the Border Crossing website and you can pick yourself up a non-resident firearm declaration form. This declaration form is pretty easy to fill out. It just has your general information, date of birth, name, uh, has your gender, the reason for why you're bringing weapons into Canada. Uh, you have to put an address on there, city, state, country, and the postal zip code. Next thing is a type of identification. So I put on there just my regular driver's license, the state that it's issued in, and your driver's license number. Um, under that, you're going to start listing your actual firearms that you're taking. So you will have to provide the information on the type of firearm, and the categories that you have are shotgun, rifle, combination gun, handgun, or other. You have to provide the make, serial, the gauge, and barrel length of all of these and you can choose as far as the barrel length you can choose to put it in millimeters or inches um, and then you have to choose the action so the action is break open bolt lever pump semi-automatic and other and then if your firearm is restricted give the following information so you have to have authorization um, so you can get waivers for those um, that's pretty much all you have to fill out on this form it's just one sheet uh, down at the bottom, it asks for your signature. I've been advised to do that in front of the actual Border Patrol agent, so not to do it at this time. Um, so I do have this filled out, ready to go. On this back sheet, it also does have uh, numbers for you to call. So if you want to see what number, or if you want to call to get the most up-to-date information, which I highly advise you do, the number that they gave me to call the Border Crossing Direct Agents, is 506-636-5064. And then you'll have to go through a menu that has a bunch of options. Uh, if the menu doesn't change, in order for me to get to the actual weapons information portion of it, it was uh, the extensions one, one, two, four, three, Zero. And all of those are different menus, but uh, those are the actual numbers in order to get you through each individual menu. Uh, the zero at the end will get you to a live person so that you don't have to listen. The menu does cover a lot of information, but there is some other stuff that I still have questions on and wanted to talk to an agent. So that's the information on that. As far as actual ammo goes, uh, I did call them and I was planning on taking ammo that uh, are considered prohibited um, for the for the actual weapons to go through would be considered prohibited. Uh, so we're only taking the shotguns, but I have weapons, um, I have pistols, and I have rifles and whatnot. So I do have some ammo that would go to technically prohibited uh, weapons, and I asked him if I was going to run into a problem there. Uh, what the agent told me was that he highly encourages that I just mail it instead because if uh, they ask and I tell them, you know, I have ammo for these other weapons, then they're going to want to search all our stuff and make sure that we don't actually have those weapons with us. So at this rate, what we're going to do is we're sending off all of our high capacity mags because I don't want to run into issues with there and I'm pretty sure those are prohibited. And then any ammo other than directly related to the firearms that we are actually taking across the border. We did a little bit of research and uh, what we have found is that UPS actually has some information on their website and saying that they can ship ammunition, but there are spec uh, specifications and restrictions for that. So you can go to UPS website and actually look up that information yourself. So you're getting ready to move. There's a ton of stuff to do. A good checklist in order for you to use to make sure that you've got it all taken care of is the Rally Point PCS checklist. You can find it on rallypoint.com. It's a great resource. Rally Point is also a wonderful place for you to go as a service member to get information about whatever you have a question on. It's a huge online community forum where you can go and answer uh, questions that other people have or you can ask your own questions 
to anything that you have in order to get those answers that you need, whether it be military related or move related or whatever it may be. It's an awesome place to do it, but they do have an actual PCS checklist in order for you to do it. It's a very lengthy one. I believe it was 13 pages when we downloaded it, so it is very in-depth but it is a wonderful checklist for you to use. And it does also cover the differences between going O-CONUS and CONUS. So it's a very good checklist to use. You don't really get to choose which moving company you use unless you finance it yourself. But when Army does it, you just get whichever one that they actually contract out to do your stuff. As we were getting ready to move out, Golden North was the van line company that was used to help us move and I can say, uh, I cannot be grateful enough for these people who actually came out and did our move. We have some of the paperwork that they did here. Um, we only had what they estimated at the, their updated estimate only said uh, right around, I think, 6,000 pounds. And you can see all of these yellow sheets are stuff. There's probably about 15 sh uh, sheets or so. These are all things that uh, that they filled out line by line specific items so they were very thorough i know that we've had tons of issues uh, with friends and we have had issues in the past with people not taking um, their time and uh, not being serious about it just not caring about our stuff when they're moving it and a lot of our things have been broken before this golden north uh, Van Lines was extremely careful with everything that they did for us. They wrapped every single individual item to make sure that everything was completely pro uh, protected. We did go through before they came though and we actually took everything off the walls and pretty much dismantled a lot of stuff. We didn't take anything big apart because if we do it then we have to install it when we get there. Um, but little things we did take apart and actually put in an area for them. We put all of our high values in one room, our high value items in one room, and then we put all of our breakables in another room. So we could actually watch them pack them, and they did an amazing job. They uh, moved very quickly, very efficiently. They wrapped everything, and they were very thorough on their documentation. I also am shipping my motorcycle. You can ship things like motorcycles, ATVs, boats. There are restrictions on them. For my motorcycle, in order to ship it, I had to drain the fuel tank, the oil, and disconnect the battery, and I taped over those terminals. Uh, we don't have to send the keys with them. Uh, some of the information that they did want, though, was the year, uh, the make, model, and the miles on it. Just to, You're giving that information to make sure that nobody is driving it or whatnot. And they do go ahead and annotate also any ding, scratchers, or other marks on any vehicle or item that you are shipping with them. So I cannot praise them enough for what they did, and I hope that you are able to receive Golden North as your moving company coming to or from Alaska. Extra fuel is definitely something that you're going to want to think about having whenever you go somewhere in Alaska. If you're just putting around town, then it's not a big deal, but if you're ever gonna go uh, to say the North Slope or down South, um, and especially if you're driving in and through Canada, then you're gonna wanna have some extra fuel with you. Uh, when we took the truck, we on the way up here, we threw four extra five gallon cans of fuel in the truck and uh, we did when we were driving, we left pretty early in the morning one particular day and we came to a gas station at Destruction Bay and they hadn't opened up yet and we decided to go ahead and skip that and that we could probably make it to another stop. Well, that didn't work out. Fortunately, we had those extra fuel cans in the back and while a pilot car, while we were waiting for a pilot car, we were able to fill up our tank and, and get to the next actual uh, fuel spot. But there were places in there where, especially if you're gonna try and drive through and if you're driving at night and whatnot, that you are gonna want to have that extra fuel. And then if you are going up north in Alaska, it's also a time that you're probably gonna wanna bring extra fuel because the gas stations on the routes 
are pretty far in between. We have a Garmin GPS in which we use to bring us to Alaska and I just updated the maps and we're going to use it to leave as well uh, in conjunction to the milepost map though. So the milepost is going to give us uh, the ability to use that the whole time. The actual GPS in Canada, especially in some parts, and even in some parts of Alaska, the signal just completely cuts out. And we didn't have any phone service, we didn't have um, a lot of radio signal, and our GPS would cut out. So we are using that, and they do use some of the satellites, but even then there's still a few spots where it cuts out and where it's not gonna update like it's supposed to. So don't completely rely on your GPS or other units because they may cut out. No service zones are very common during this drive going in and through Canada and some parts of Alaska. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you actually have uh, devices that are gonna have the best service possible. You may want to look into getting the international plan, at least for the days that you're traveling through Canada to help out with some of that service. It's not always gonna work in all the parts, but we ran into multiple places on our drive up here where our OnStar lost the service and we couldn't use it anymore. XM Radio really has a hard time anywhere through Canada and Alaska. So just make sure you take that into account when you're planning your drive is that you are going to hit places where you're not going to have any access to signal and you need to be able to plan appropriately in order to reach roadside assistance or just figure out where you're going with your routes. So make sure you have a hard copy of the map at least somewhere, even if you don't use the mile post, just so you can make this trip safely. Prices in Alaska are ridiculous. You can go out to just a regular fast food place here and you're probably going to be spending a, at least $2 more per person on average just for the same meal. It is very expensive up here. Um, anything you do costs more. It's generally because it costs so much to have everything shipped up here. Uh, vehicles also cost more. So uh, an average vehicle up here, if you're trying to buy one here, costs probably a few thousand dollars more. Um, the best thing and what we actually ended up doing on our drive up was in uh, one of the states as we were coming up pulling the trailer we bought a new truck so we traded in our old one bought the new truck and we had them hold off on uh, doing the taxes on it because we were going to register it in Alaska so we put a temporary uh, address in Alaska on the registration so that we wouldn't be charged taxes because Alaska is tax free and that's where we're going to be living um, so that is, that's a good buy off. Uh, if you purchase something down in the lower 48, then you can get their pricing, you can get their pricing and then just register it in Alaska so that it is tax free. So that is a good trade off. But if you actually buy up here, it will be tax free, but you're paying more because they had to have items shipped here. Uh, another thing that does help out service members while you're up here though, is COLA. COLA goes up and down all the time. It varies uh, every month or every few months. They do surveys, I think, at least once a year or so, and that will also adjust how much they give you COLA, and it's based on rank also, and then it's also based on how many dependents you have. As of uh, right now, the COLA used to be much higher, but just for instance, for me, uh, we lost $300 a month on COLA recently due to some of the surveys. So whenever they do surveys here and housing will put it out, the army will put it out and ask you to fill out the surveys form, it is very important for you to be honest on those and to fill those surveys out because that's how we got the COLA up a little bit higher a few years ago. So when we initially came up, it was probably about the same price and then it's risen for the last two years and then it just dropped. So please participate in those surveys. It's really gonna help you and everybody else out. ACS is gonna be your, one of your most helpful resources during your move. Uh, you're gonna to want to get with them before you PCS on either end. It's your leaving installation, um, or so either when you leave a different installation or as soon as you get here or vice versa, get with ACS because they have so many resources to help you out with your move. 
Some of the stuff that they were able to do for us here at this location at Fort Wainwright was uh, during your actual levy brief, as I'm getting ready to leave, they give you this little booklet, which is the smooth move. This smooth move uh, talks about how all the resources to get from Alaska back down to the lower 48. A lot of these still apply for the trip up to Alaska as well though. I haven't been able to find a digital version of this. Uh, this, this one was updated last on 6 July of 2017. I'm going to see if I can get a digital version and get it out to you guys. If not, I may just take apart this booklet once we are done, try and scan it in and actually get it to you guys because this has been the most helpful resource for us during this entire move. It talks about different regulations to move, uh, TLA, the actual uh, PPM rates, the per diem rates for moving, it gives the information for the border crossing, how to ship your vehicle, everything. Uh, some of the programs that they have available here, this booklet has been amazing. Another thing that ACS can do, which can also really help you out on your actual travel plans, and I'm sure they can do it at the other installations too, is they can give you a travel plan. So you just go into ACS and you give them a general idea of the route that you're going to be taking and where you might want to stop. And they can hook you up with information about the stuff that is in the local area where you're going to stop for you to do stuff while you're there. So if you spend some time, if you get there early enough, then, it gives you, then they can give you some resources about some places to go and see on your drive through there as well as giving you some other information about stuff that is on and through that area. Next thing is uh, while we went to ACS during our uh, outgoing brief, they were able to give us a welcome packet for our family. They even put our name on there and everything. And this welcome packet has a bunch of really good information. This is for our new post that we're going to. And so your old one should be able to do the same thing and they should be able to get you a packet for Fort Wainwright if you're coming up to here or if you are here going somewhere else, then same thing. They can give you a welcome packet to the new post that you're going to be going to. The lending closet is also an amazing resource for you to use and ACSs have it all over the Army. Uh, we have used the lending closet. Uh, for this particular move, we didn't use it on our way up here, but we are using it right now because we have already, the movers have already came and picked up all of our stuff already. So all we have left is the basics that we're going to be taking back. And I'm not calling a trailer this time. It was pretty miserable on the way up here. And some of the grading um, on the roads just made it absolutely horrendous trying to pull a trailer. Um, personal procured move, the rates. Uh, also at this time just they have went down and down and down they keep on going down over the years and they just don't compensate you very well for moving yourself anymore so we are doing our move uh, except this time we're just going in a van and it's going to get way better fuel mileage than my truck did we're uh, using a tent on the back and it's going to go work a whole lot better for that so being that all we have right now is stuff that can fit into our van all of our cookware is gone, all of our bedding is gone, um, pretty much everything in the house is gone, we just have the bare basics. So the lending closet has all sorts of stuff, all you have to do is go into ACS, tell them that you want to go to the lending closet, they'll hook you up with an appointment to go talk with the representative, you'll fill out an application, which is just you requesting specific items that they have, they'll give you a checklist of things that they have and offer some of the things that they do have here, as of right now anyway, are they do have vacuums, they have cookware sets, they have crock pots, they have baking sets, they have uh, um, foldable bedding. So we have like twin size mattresses, they actually fold into thirds. They had a larger size bedding as well. Um, that's all I can think of right off the top of my head, but those are all really good resources for you. Uh, they do have blenders and other things. There's a lot of stuff that we didn't get, um, but those are just some things that we did get. And I'll go ahead and show you some of the stuff uh, right now. So this is all some of the stuff that we got from the lending closet. There's the uh, cookie sheet, there is a pizza pan, there is a actual baking dish with a lid, 
a toaster. If we come over here, they have small crock pots. This was uh, the biggest one they had, at least when we did it. So there's the small crock pot. There is a, a cookware set for oven cooking. Uh, and then the lids for them and everything. There's the bowl set with multiple bowls there. Um, this actual kitchen set was supposed to be 25 pieces. I'm not gonna remember all of them, but they also have tons of utensils and stuff. Um, there are knives in here, spatulas, spoons, all sorts of things, and it has been really awesome. We were also going to get a, a dishware set, but they were glass, um, all of the pieces in it, and we have little kids, so we opted not to do that, and we're just using disposables at this time. So you're coming to Alaska. Some of the resources and things that you're gonna wanna know about, which I wish I did when I came up here, um, are things like happy lamps and blackout shades and vitamin D and so on. During the summer here, the sun is up most of the time. Uh, during the actual solstice, you're gonna have 24 hours of sunlight. It may be dusky uh, at points, but you're still gonna have 24 hours of sunlight. Uh, a lot of people, you'll just end up staying up later. It doesn't feel like it's late at all. As of right now, it's July and at like 10 o'clock at night there's still light out and it, it, it really makes you feel like it's not that late out so people stay up a lot later um, and you get a lot less sleep just because you're used to it during the winter is the exact opposite during the solstice in the winter um, there's going to be just i think about three to four hours of actual daylight out there and it's mostly dusky at that point so it's not actually like legit sun um, it's just a bunch of dust it's it's very low light for you and it can be really miserable due to that low light uh, during the winter and a lot of people staying indoors a lot of people get depression during that time because you're not getting um, the sunlight that actually makes you a lot happier and whatnot so you can, if you need to, get some supplements to help you out. One of the ways of doing that is just to get happy lamps. You can buy them at the stores. I think some of them are about $20 and then they'll go up and get much more expensive. They have timers on them. Um, ours were not terribly expensive. We actually purchased ours on Amazon before we ever came up here and they do have the timers and everything on them. And what we usually do is just in the morning, whenever we're getting ready to get up and do breakfast and things, We'll sit the kids down and we'll put it on the table, plug it in, just turn it on. So while we're getting ready for the day or just eating breakfast, then we'll have that happy lamp going. It'll just help you out a little bit. Um, the other thing is blackout shades. Actually, the other thing is vitamin D. If you're noticing that you're having um, a little bit more depression than normal and that you're just acting kind of funny, then you can go see your provider here and they can give you a higher dose of uh, vitamin D to help you out with that and that should help you uh, throughout the winter. On the flip side of that, during the summer, because of all of that sunlight, you will want to have blackout shades. Blackout shades, they do have really expensive ones, but there's also some fairly cheap ones which are uh, just made of um, black paper that folds kind of accordion style and goes in the windows um, and we'll show you some of those. These are blackout shades. So they just fold up like that. They have the clip and then they'll fold down. So you can see this room is uh, much darker. If I actually close the door, then it actually gets pretty dark in here and it's midday right now. Um, and then it's pretty easy to disengage them. You just lift them back up and then you apply the clip again. There are tons of places for you to go off post in order for you to get an authentic Alaskan experience. There's too many for me to cover here, but I'm just going to highlight some of them which are going to give you the Alaskan experience and not just a social experience. Um, some places are uh, the Riverboat Discovery. It can be a little bit expensive to do this one, but it is actually going to take you on the river. It's going to take you out to some of uh, the villages that are up the river and actually allow you to see how some people live and give you an experience of Alaska itself. 
Uh, the river boat um, is a good thing to do and uh, they do have promotional rates sometimes during the year so you just have to listen and watch for them and you should be able to pick up a promotional rate and get a deal. Last time tracking it's uh, I think just over $100 per person for you to do it. During Christmas they do have a uh, ride on the train that goes from Anchorage to Fairbanks. Uh, that's also a little bit more expensive, but that's also a, a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity for you to go on a route like that. And uh, you only have to do it once, but it's a beautiful ride and you're going to see lots of Alaska in the prime winter conditions. Uh, there are sled dogs up here and they do the sled races. So depending on the years, sometimes uh, they will start in Fairbanks. A lot of times it will start in some other place and then they'll come through or near uh, Fairbanks. So every other year the Iditarod uh, comes through here and some of the mushers, they'll have their dogs out and available for you to go see. And sometimes they'll uh, do uh, little sled dog rides for you. Some of them can be free depending on the event that you go to. Other times you do have to pay for it, uh, but those are really good opportunities for you to get the family out and actually see that. There are the ice sculptures that are all around and people go and carve those up. Some, uh, some of the ones that they have are actual interactive ones. So they'll make sleds and everything and tunnels and toys for the kids to go on and stuff. And so for that, that's a really good thing to see and experience. There is the Santa Claus house, which is in the North Pole, um, which is about 20 minutes or so away from Fort Wainwright here uh, on the highway. Santa Claus house is really awesome. Santa Claus house is a great place to go. They do have a Santa in there. And every time we went there, the Santa was in there, not just during Christmas. Uh, I don't think they're in there as frequently during the off year, but Santa has been there every time we have went there. Uh, they just remodeled it, and so we haven't really seen the inside after the remodel this last time, but they do have a little cafe in there too where you can get hot chocolate, coffee, and fudge, all sorts of good things. You can get ornaments in there. Um, the kids can also get personal letters from Santa. You can actually sign up and register for those. Uh, you'd have to pay for it. I think it's an annual fee for however long you want to do it for. Um, but they have really awesome things and you can actually send letters to the Santa Claus House, uh, North Pole, Alaska. So it's a really cool thing to see and experience. And part of some of the attractions they have there are the reindeers also. So they have reindeers that you can go out. I think you have to pay to feed them, um, but that is an option. And you can always, you know, stand on the other side of the fence and you can take pictures and just see them and, and the kids can go see them. And that's a really cool opportunity. There is Pioneer Park. Pioneer Park is probably one of our favorite places to go as a family here. Pioneer Park is a really awesome place to go. It's probably the favorite place for us to go as a family off post. Uh, they have all sorts of things in there. They had the right in the entrance is the old river boat, which unfortunately at this time they're getting ready. Uh, you can't go through there anymore. When we first got here, you could actually go through the boat and uh, from what I'm aware, they're trying to, there's something going on where they're possibly going to break it down, uh, but I think there's some petitions going up trying to save it from being um, dismantled and moved. Um, but that boat is a really awesome thing. They do have some train cars in there. They have all sorts of little shops that you can go to. So there's authentic photography shops in there. There are little food places, there are souvenir places, there's a little theater in there, there's a, I think, a little dance hall in there, there's the Salmon Bake. Salmon Bake is an all-you-can-eat experience. They do offer a military discount, from what I remember as well. I believe it was between $30 and $40 a person. Okay, so you get all-you-can-eat brisket, um, a special glaze on your salmon and then there is a beer batter cod that was in there. You can pay extra and then you can get the Alaskan crab but that is extra. Uh, they also have like the salad bar through there and then they have a very small dessert area which for the most part just has some sheet cake and toppings on it. 
I don't remember a whole lot else being in there. I was not terribly impressed with that. I don't think it's worth the price, but it's definitely, it was a good experience to go and uh, have it at one point. Other things there in Pioneer Park is there are tons of little play areas in there. So they have multiple different playground areas that the kids can play at. And then there's a little interactive area in there too that has like a little light show type thing. Um, which is a game for the kids. It's not like a big light show. They do have the air museum that is in there um, Does cost money to go into the air museum uh, I think right outside Pioneer Park There is a place where you can I think rent some boats and stuff to go down the river that runs uh, pretty close by there um, what else? There is the there is an awesome little train that goes through there. I believe it was about five dollars per person, and it takes you all the way around Pioneer Park. They toot the horn. Um, they actually it's a it's a guided experience. So they talk to you as you're on the train, and they explain what the different places are there and everything. Um, so it's a really awesome place to go. It has tons of things for you to do there. And then there are the food shops also that you can get there. Even if you don't go to the Salmon Bake, they have a few food shops. Um, one of our favorite ones only takes cash. So I would be sure to take cash if you are gonna go and um, just keep that in mind. There's the UAF Museum. The UAF uh, Museum has a lot of stuff. They have uh, stuffed animals and whatnot up there, just genuine Alaska animals that you can see, as well as uh, some historical artifacts and things so you can see how people used to live and whatnot. It's a really good thing. So the museum is free if you're with an active duty service member. So that's an awesome thing and, uh, to do and, and place to go. There is the pipeline. Um, you can follow the the pipeline you can take pictures with it it's a pretty prominent thing in alaska all the oil you know uh, so that is kind of cool to go and take family pictures with it near one of the pipeline locations so there is a gold panning place next to one of those pipeline locations forget the exact name of it but we have been there a few times and you actually um, you're guaranteed you purchase a bag from them and the bag has a little bit of gold in there and so you uh, purchase a different size of bag and the different bags have different guarantees for how much gold you're going to find and you take it out and you actually practice uh, panning for gold. And the last thing I'm going to mention off post for an authentic uh, Alaskan experience is Denali National Park. You can go through there, you can drive a certain length into it and then it stops and the only way that you can get past there is with a bus unless um, I think once a year or so they have lottery programs where you can put in and somebody will win the opportunity to take their vehicle all the way up the road. But it's really cool, they have camping, hiking, uh, there's the bus rides through there, you can take pictures, it is a wonderful place to go to actually see Alaska and be able to experience it. There are some uh, wonderful places that you can go on posts, they do have a lot of resources, not as many as other posts, it is a pretty small one, but we're in the middle of Alaska for goodness sake, so you just have to keep that in mind. It takes me about 15 minutes to get all the way across the post uh, from the front gate to the back gate. Um, the main road that goes through here is Gaffney Road. Um, some of the other main roads that you're probably going to want to know and there's some that you can plug into your GPS if you're trying to find your way here or whatnot. Uh, there is Gaffney Road which is the main one that runs from the front to the rear gate. There is Santiago Avenue which is where a lot of the actual battalions are that are here. And uh, there is also the library, there is the PX, there is um, the Welcome Center. There's all sorts of stuff right there on that road. That's a very uh, prominent one that you're gonna want to, to know about. Another really good one that you're gonna wanna know about is Neely Road. So you're gonna find the hospital off of Neely Road. There's also the education center. There's the North Haven housing office. There are some schools that are on this road. So those are the three real prominent roads that are on post that have a lot of things that you're gonna be looking for. Um, past that, we're going to give you some video snippets of a few of the places just so you can see the building and have an overall view of it before you ever get here. Um, but those are some of the main roads that you're going to want to know about. 
This is one of the CDCs. There are two here and they're pretty close to the actual schools. There's the elementary that's not too far away from here. And I'll show you that one, but CDC. This is the school age services building. They do some preschool here. There is also a little bit of uh, after hours care that is done here. So this is a pretty good building. And these are all pretty close to the school and the CDCs, which are the uh, child development centers where they do the daycare. This is the Arctic Lights Elementary and they have the playground back there. That's the elementary school on post. This building is the youth center and they have a lot of programs here. This is the North Haven's community building. This is where you go to actually uh, get with your housing manager and everything. This is the education center on post. They have uh, the traditional classes and everything and get you hooked up for schooling. And then they have some of the uh, certifications that you can sign up for if you're ETSing. This is the hospital, Bassett Army Community Hospital, or a lot of people call it Bach. This is a roundabout and most people don't know how to use it. This is the lemon lot. So this is a private resale lot. You just have to pay a fee to park your stuff here. Um, not all this stuff is actually for sale. Some people just park it here because it's cheap. It's the same price as the other Eagle's Nest parking lot that is here on post, but this one's um, a little bit more visible and stuff. Sometimes stuff gets stolen out of the other ones. So not all of these are actually for sale. This is the main gym. They call it the PFC or Physical Fitness Center. I don't like to go here as often because it is uh, way more busy than the other one. And so uh, I just prefer to go to the smaller one, but this does have quite a bit of stuff and there is an indoor track. This is the exchange and the commissary right there, both together. There also is a food court in here. The exchange is pretty small. It's the smallest I've ever been in um, from any other post that I've ever been on. There are some other little stores in there too, um, like Patriot Tactical is in there, and then the food court, and then some other little things as well. But uh, this building has both the exchange and the commissary. This is the Holiday Inn Express, the hotel that is on post. It's also near the Welcome Center and the PX. So uh, if you are PCSing to or from here, this is a hotel that you can use. And uh, it is close to the amenities that are on post. This is Welcome Center. This is where you do your in-processing at. Has a lot of stuff in there. ACS is in there. Um, the MPD, uh, most of the stuff, uh, the main housing office that uh, actually determines which one of the housing areas that you go into and everything. So this is a very important building for uh, incomers and outgoers. You'll also notice the electrical boxes. This is for during winter when your cars freeze. You plug them in during the winter so that they don't die. This building is Kamish Clinic. This is where uh, some of the soldiers can go to get their individual needs. There's also uh, behavioral health located in here and dental. So this is also a pretty big portion of in-processing because a lot of time you have to go to those. Um, not all providers are in here, but some of them are. So soldiers generally have to go here. This one is Malavan Fitness Center. This is the smaller gym. A lot less people in here though. They still have plenty of workout equipment and there is a pool in this one. So I do like this one. Uh, the main gym, I did forget, they do have an ice rink that you can go to during the winter as well. This is Nugget Lanes. It's the bowling center. They do have some food in there and also drinks and the bowling. This is the furniture store. It is separate from the PX and everything. So furniture store and uh, the, they do have a decent selection of stuff, but uh, it is separate from the PX. It's not very far from it but it is a different building. This is what some of the barracks look at. So nothing too impressive. Um, there are a lot of single soldiers here, enough to where um, in some of the rooms they're having to put two people. So it is pretty, uh, pretty packed here. Last thing I have for you is the Post Library and Mac Federal Credit Union. That's the bank that is here on post. 
And then this is the post library. It's pretty small, but it's a pretty good one. And they have computers here for soldiers to use uh, if you have to like print things off and whatnot. You are limited in printing, but good place to go. For my outgoing personnel, things specific to Fort Wainwright that not all posts have and that you're going to want to know about are the quartermaster. When you go and set up your CIF to uh, turn it in and everything, they actually have it in the packet, at least right now, and they recommend that you go to the quartermaster. You don't have to, but when you go to the quartermaster and have them clean your items because they can't clean it, and you don't have to wait until you're PCSing or ETSing also, you can do it before then. Um, if your stuff is really dirty and whatnot, you can go turn it in. Just understand that you're going to have to disassemble some of your stuff in order to turn it into the quartermaster, but it is a really good resource um, for cleaning your items. Uh, as far as ETSing and PCSing for CIF, if you have it cleaned in quartermaster and have the receipt showing that it's been cleaned, then they cannot kick back your gear. They have to accept it the way it is, uh, even if it's not clean, as long as it's been through quartermaster, they have to accept it, so it is really good. You're just gonna have to plan for time. I have put up in Google, though, um, actual, some pictures of it. It has the hours, it has some instructions on the things that you have to disassemble for your gear and whatnot. Um, so I have put some pictures up on that. You can just Google it, so just Google uh, Fort Wainwright Quartermaster. You can also Google Fort Wainwright CIF and I put a picture of their hours on there as well. So you have that information if you need it. For the Quartermaster, when you turn your stuff in there, you're going to have to allow a four day window. They tell you four days and then uh, in order to get some of your mittens back, it'll actually say five days because they can't put those in the dryer. They have to air uh, dry them. So. That is some, uh, just plan on four to five days. I gave them a whole week and I'll go pick them up uh, after that. I turned that in when the movers were coming. That way, um, none of that stuff was here and they were able to take everything else with them. Uh, but that way it was completely out of the way and I didn't have to worry about the movers even coming across them in order to pack them up and take them. Um, some other things that you're gonna wanna know about is TLA. You can get up to 10 days of TLA. Um, so from the time that you clear housing is when your TLA starts and then you can get up to 10 days max. Um, but it's 10 days from your actual uh, PCS or ETS or your leave date, the start of your leave date for PCS or ETS. So you start it there and then go 10 days back, um, but your TLA won't actually start until you clear housing. So we are taking advantage of that opportunity to get that TLA. They do give you per diem rates for lodging and for food during that time. But that way, um, one reason that we're doing that is that I, we are going to be completely cleared out of housing before I start out processing. And that's going to allow me as a service member to focus on just out processing without having to worry about being here for the movers and scheduling all of that stuff. Uh, PPMs is what the new Diddy move is. It's a uh, personally procured move and it just doesn't pay as much uh, to move your own stuff anymore. I used to do it every single time. We've moved a few times now and we've done a Diddy move or a PPM move, uh, a partial anyway, not a full. Um, both those times and we were able to make a decent amount of money on those before but the rates have just went down, so it's not really worth it at this point. Putting the miles on your vehicle, uh, the huge waste of gas if you're actually pulling a large trailer or whatnot, and just the wear and tear that's going to be associated with that. So just be aware of that. As of right now, um, the rates for that is just over a dollar a pound. It's, it's not very much at all. Um, the place here in Alaska in which you have to get your uh, vehicle weighed if you are doing a PPM or a partial ditty or a ditty is at the Tesoro scale. When you go to the scale, you have to provide your military ID and some basic information about your unit, contact information, whatnot, and then you do have to provide the year, make, model of your vehicle so they fill it out on the actual piece of paper. So just be aware of that when you go do it. But Tesoro, that is off of South Cushman, um, way down by the dealerships. 
Uh, so it's down the road of ways if you're coming off of the airport going on uh, on the South Cushman then it, it is down quite far so just keep on driving and you'll eventually see it down there you just stop inside first um, let them know that you need to use the scale you fill out the paperwork then you'll drive around park on the scale on the scale go back in and they'll give it to you pay for it and you just gotta drive off at that point just here wrapping up the video and uh, I know it's been a long one, there's a lot of information in there, but I'm just trying to give you as many resources as I possibly can to make this a little bit easier for you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'd be grateful to try and answer them for you. I uh, am pretty busy though, so it may take me a while to get back with you. I've left as many links to the resources and everything as I can in the description below. And hopefully some other people can also answer questions that I haven't been able to get to yet. If you want to go ahead and support me, I'd greatly appreciate it if you'd subscribe to this channel. And uh, I also have another one which is DIY with Chris. I show uh, other things on how to do things on vehicles and whatnot. If you are coming to Alaska as well, I do have a how to winterize your vehicle uh, video that is on that channel and I'd appreciate if you could subscribe to that one as well. But uh, I really appreciate you watching this video and I really hope that it helped out. So have a great day.